Chapter 1. The Terrible Ordeal of the Average African American in the United States African Americans are one of the largest groups in the United States. They belong to an ethnic group of Americans whose progenitors are totally or partially Africans. African Americans migrated to America during the slave trade era in the 16th to 19th centuries. During this time, white men saw African Americans as inferior and fitting to be no more than slaves. Hence, racism became rampant. African American slaves were made to work primarily on rice, tobacco, cotton, and sugar plantations. African Americans were believed not to be able to amount to anything. When African Americans attempted to pursue prestigious careers, they were advised to stop dreaming big and consider manual labor. This inferiority ate so deep into the fabric of the mindset of the average African American, and most of them believed that they would end up on the streets. African Americans were segregated to the ghettos, slums occupied by minority groups because of illegal discrimination and economic and social pressures. Every human being deserves equal respect and dignity. The autobiography of Malcolm X depicts the experiences of the average African American in the United States. In this summary, you will better understand the black ghettos and how they shape the lives and thoughts of the African Americans living there. The black man in the ghettos, for instance, has to start self-correcting his own material, moral, and spiritual defects and evils. Malcolm X Malcolm X's traumatic childhood experiences and their awful consequences On the 19th of May, 1925, Malcolm Little, later known as Malcolm X, was born in an Omaha hospital in the United States when his mom, Louise Little, was only 28 years old. He was the seventh child of nine children. Malcolm Little's father, Reverend Earl Little, a Baptist preacher, and his family were constantly harassed by the Ku Klux Klan riders, an American white supremacist terrorist hate group, because they were African Americans. In 1931, when Malcolm was six years old, his father was assassinated. At this time, Louise Little was 34 years old, with no one to assist her in taking care of her children. Things were so difficult that Louise started buying things on credit. Then she had to work to make ends meet. Louise got jobs working for white people, but she constantly got sacked when her employers realized she was an African American. Louise looked like a white woman with straight black hair and a white accent because her father was white. Losing a spouse isn't easy because it leaves only one person to bear the whole family's responsibility. In 1937, Malcolm Little's family was separated by the state welfare office after Louise suffered a complete breakdown. His older siblings were allowed to stay in the house their father had built before his death because they were old enough to take care of themselves. At the age of 13, he was taken to the Gohanases, and families adopted the other children in Lansing. Not long after, he was sent to a detention home and a reform school located at Mason because he was becoming notorious. It was at the detention home that he met Mrs. Swirlin, who ran the facility. Mrs. Swirlin enrolled him in Mason Junior High School, and he was the only African American in the class. In 1940, everything changed when he got the opportunity to visit his elder sister, Ella Little, in Boston. He got the shock of his life when he saw many black people behaving differently from the African Americans in Lansing and Mason. On his return to Mason, he became a different boy. He found it difficult to relate with his white folks. He eventually left for Boston to be with Ella when he graduated from 8th grade. Chapter 3. Be mindful of the friends you keep. They can either make or break you. On arrival at Roxbury in Boston, Ella Little advised Malcolm Little not to go job hunting immediately, but to go sightseeing to get acquainted with the city. As he went around the neighborhood, he noticed that the African Americans residing in the Wombeck and Humboldt Avenue Hill section of Roxbury were doing all it took to imitate white people. After much sightseeing, he met Shorty, who recommended him for a job at the Roseland State Ballroom as a shoe shiner. Shorty introduced Malcolm to buying things on credit, drinking liquor, smoking cigarettes and cannabis, and gambling. Also, he developed an interest in Lindy Hopping, a fast, energetic dance popular in the late 1930s and 1940s, such that he never missed a Rosalind Lindy Hop as long as he stayed in Boston. Malcolm Little's first step to self-degradation was when he relaxed and dyed his hair to look like a white man's hair. Malcolm Little quit his shoe shining job and started working at the Townsend Drugstore as a soda fountain clerk. It was at the drugstore that he met Laura, a friendly lady who loved reading. Her parents went their separate ways when she was a baby and left her with her grandmother. He and Laura started hanging out a lot. Laura broke a lot of her grandma's rules to go lindy hopping with him. 
It was in one of those dances that Little met Sophia, a white woman. They became an item which gave him a lot of status in the black community. Malcolm Little later moved out of Ella's house, quit his job at the drugstore, and became a waiter at the Parker House in Boston. I had joined that multitude of Negro men and women in America who are brainwashed into believing that the black people are inferior and white people superior. That they will even violate and mutilate their God-created bodies to try to look pretty by white standards. Malcolm X Chapter 4 The young and wide-eyed Malcolm Little morphs into Detroit Red, the hustler. Ella Little's friend, an elderly Pullman porter called Roundtree, recommended a railroad job for Malcolm Little. He was excited about the job because working on the railways meant free rides to New York. On his new job, Malcolm Little started by helping to load food requisitions onto the trains. Soon enough, he began working as a fourth cook, and whatever downtime he had, he spent sightseeing in downtown Washington. He soon realized that the state capitol played host to an African-American community in much worse shape than Roxbury. However, when he got the rare opportunity to visit Upper End New York, he found it was nothing short of impressive, specifically because of Small's Paradise. Between Small's and the Apollo Center, he was a changed man by the end of the day. At age 17, he was fired from his railway job, but he snagged a position in Small's Paradise where he learned so much. He racked up a great deal of knowledge on a wide variety of subjects between overhearing old-timers reminiscing about their great times and listening to customers who felt like talking. The people you surround yourself with determine your perspective about life and the choices you make. Malcolm Little was dubbed Detroit Red because of his dyed bright red hair. By this time, he had become a fixture in Small's Paradise familiarizing himself with hopeful gamblers and old-timers who he learned never to run afoul of. Black Sammy, Bob Hewlett, King, Padmore, and West Indian Archie were some of the toughest criminals he got acquainted with. A few others took a liking to him and were soon attempting to straighten him out. With his employment, he moved to a rooming house, befriended the sex workers who ran the accommodation, and began learning a great deal about men. After accidentally referring an undercover military agent to one of his hosts, he was relieved of his job at Small's Paradise and banned from visiting. With Sammy the Pimp's help, he began selling marijuana in the New York music scene. At first, his business took off, but not long after, the local narcotics squad was on his tail, and he eventually began running at a loss and was reduced to begging for money to eat. Chapter 5 Malcolm Little's high-risk life came at the cost of being run out of town. Malcolm Little started exploiting others for a living. He took to crime because he deemed himself a direct victim of the biases of racism. Soon enough, he incorporated hard drugs into his routine operations. Your environment has a direct effect on your behavior, so surround yourself with good people. Malcolm Little stopped trusting his friend Sammy after an unsuccessful robbery attempt. A bullet almost hit Sammy, and they had to split up to escape the police. In the morning, he went to Sammy's house to see how he was doing. On his arrival, he met Sammy's girlfriend shouting and crying because of Sammy's involvement in the robbery. This irritated him to the point that he hit her. This made Sammy pull the trigger. Fortunately for Malcolm Little, Sammy's girlfriend helped him to escape. Although he forgave Sammy for attempting to kill him, he didn't trust him as before. Shortly after Malcolm Little survived almost being shot by Sammy, West Indian Archie, a criminal in New York, came to Sammy's apartment to look for Malcolm Little and threatened him because of miscommunication regarding their gambling profits. Malcolm Little knew the threat was beyond the cash. Archie just wanted to make a fool of him because he was afraid that Little wanted to gain stature by deceiving him. So, to protect his reputation, Archie told everyone about his threat to Malcolm Little. This incident with Archie affected Little so much that he almost killed Archie at the risk of being arrested. Malcolm Little's drug habit eventually deteriorated, and Sammy had to call Shorty from Boston to get him out of Harlem. Chapter 6. Going to prison had some unexpected but interesting outcomes for Malcolm Little. Malcolm Little returned to Boston and was inactive for a month. He was addicted to drugs and used them to shelve his worries. He wasn't working, but his girlfriend Sophia was funding his lifestyle. He spent the money betting at a gambling house owned by a man named John Hughes. Malcolm Little started a robbery gang with Sophia, her sister, Rudy, and Shorty at Roxbury to make more money. They were involved in a residential burglary where they stole valuables from wealthy people and gave them to a third party to sell. The gang's strategy was that the girls would go into a wealthy home, take notes of valuables, and then come back to draw what they saw and its position in the house. 
Little and Shorty then rob the house, with Rudy as the lookout and getaway driver. After stealing a valuable watch, the gang finally met their Waterloo. Its owner had alerted detectives and jewelers around town. All the gang members except Rudy were arrested. At a low point in Malcolm Little's life, encouragement from a few people set him on a brand new course, proving that there is a silver lining in every cloud. The case was tried in court and Malcolm Little was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in 1946 in Charleston State Prison. The first few years in prison were miserable for him. He was staying high by every means possible and was deviant to prison authorities. This anti-religious behavior led him to be nicknamed Satan. It was in prison that he met a man called Bimby. Bimby's advice and Malcolm Little's sister's letter convinced him to begin a correspondence course in English and start reading books. In 1948, he was transferred to Concord Prison. Back home, his family members had become Muslims and followers of Elijah Muhammad, whom they called the Messenger of Allah. They tried to convert him to Islam too. Reginald Little, his younger brother, sent him a letter telling him to stop eating pork and smoking. In late 1948, Malcolm Little was transferred to a low-security experimental rehabilitation prison in Norfolk, Massachusetts. Looking back, I think I really was at least slightly out of my mind. I viewed narcotics as most people regard food. I wore my guns as today I wore my neckties. Malcolm X Chapter 7 With an enabling environment and determination, you can change the trajectory of your life. Hilda Little, Malcolm Little's older sister, encouraged him to write a letter to Elijah Muhammad, which he did. Muhammad replied to his letter with money enclosed in it. The most difficult task he had to face was praying, and it took him almost a week to learn how. Soon after, he started taking delight in writing letters to Muhammad, his siblings, and other black people he had related with. But he knew that he needed to improve his writing skills and vocabulary. So he got hold of stationery and a dictionary. He wrote the words in the dictionary into his tablets and read them to himself aloud. By the next day, he could remember the meaning of most of the words. As he learned new words, he developed a passion for reading, which changed his life. He read many books on black history and slavery and buried his head in any book beneficial to the black man. He started making efforts to document Elijah Muhammad's teachings in books. Not long after, he started debating in prison, beginning his public speaking career. During his last year in prison, he was transferred back to Charleston Prison. For you to be passionate about a thing, there is a need for discipline and consistency. In 1952, Malcolm Little was released from prison in the custody of Wilfred, his oldest brother. Upon release, he got a job as a salesman at a furniture store. He lived with Wilfred and was able to learn and practice the Islamic faith. He attended Temple No. 1, the place of worship for Muslims in Detroit. Malcolm Little eventually got an axe from the Chicago headquarters of Elijah Muhammad. The axe symboled his true African family name. It also became a replacement for the name Little, Malcolm's surname. That's how Malcolm Little became popularly known as Malcolm X. In 1953, Malcolm X resigned from the furniture store and got a job at the Garwood factory in Detroit. He later became Detroit Temple No. 1's assistant minister. Chapter 8 Living According to Purpose Makes Your Life Meaningful and Productive Minister Malcolm X started traveling around to spread the teachings of Elijah Muhammad and establish more temples among the black community. He was Temple Eleven's minister in Boston, but in 1954, transferred to Philadelphia. In three months, Philadelphia's Temple Twelve was established. Due to the success in Boston and Philadelphia, Malcolm X was appointed as the minister of Temple Seven in New York City. In New York, he wasn't recording any success. Only a few people turned to Islam after his teachings. He made leaflets and went to the streets with few Muslim brothers to share them with passerby. This worked as people began to respond to Malcolm X's preachings. Next, he started targeting Christian churches. He approached black Christians coming out of church on Sundays, telling them to go and listen to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X was able to get some Christians to listen to his teachings, and most were converted to Islam. As Temple 7 grew, he started traveling to preach on weekdays, and more temples were built in Springfield and Hartford. The experiences of Malcolm X have proven to us that we can be a better version of ourselves if we live a purposeful life. In 1955, Malcolm X helped open the Number 15 Temple in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1956, the Muslim community began to grow in numbers, and many well-to-do black people were part of the community. These people started becoming ministers for Elijah Muhammad. 
1956, he developed a crush on a lady called Betty X. He told Elijah Muhammad about his feelings and Muhammad approved. On the 14th of January, 1958, Malcolm and Betty were married and later gave birth to six children. The Nation of Islam started to gain popularity in 1959. They made Amsterdam News headline, a television show, and a book about Muslims was written. The white man's press, radio, television, and other media eventually thrust the Muslims into international prominence. Not long after, Malcolm started defending the Nation of Islam in panel discussions and debates. Did you know? According to CNN, on the 12th of February 2021, Malcolm X's childhood home at Roxbury in Boston was officially recognized as a historic site. Conclusion As Malcolm X continued to be zealous in propagating Islam, rumors began to fly that he was trying to take over the Nation of Islam. In 1962, the Nation of Islam stopped publicizing the works of Malcolm X because he was becoming more popular than Elijah Muhammad. After enduring envy, jealousy, and betrayals from his brethren, Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam in 1964. Though still Muslim, he founded a religious organization called Muslim Mosque Inc., MMI. The goal of this organization was to help challenge the American black man to gain his rights and cure his spiritual, intellectual, political, and economic sickness. Malcolm X also founded a pan-Africanist secular group called the Organization of Afro-American Unity, OAAU. Defending the human rights of black Americans and promoting cooperation among them was the aim of the OAAU. Malcolm X continued having conflicts with the Nation of Islam after his exit. Hence, he kept receiving death threats from them. For instance, in February 1964, a bomb was thrown at Malcolm X's car based on the border of the Temple No. 7 leader. Elijah Muhammad also went about making speeches that suggested that he wanted Malcolm X dead. Malcolm X was assassinated on the 21st of February 1965 in New York at age 56. He was shot when he was about to address the OAAU in Manhattan's Autobahn Ballroom. He was rushed to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and he died shortly after. He was buried at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. The perpetrators of Malcolm X's death were believed to have been Thomas Hagen, Norman 3X Butler, and Thomas 15X Johnson. After the death of Malcolm X, OAAU and MMI collapsed. His statue is at the Autobahn Ballroom in the Washington Heights section of Manhattan, where he was killed. Try this. Be deliberate about the friends you keep, because they impact your life in the long run. Hang around people who are ambitious, focused, disciplined, and upright. You'll more than likely end up just like them.